Okay, so in this video we're going to move on to talking about problems with friction. And so we're going to be seeing more two-dimensional problems rather than one-dimensional problems. And two-dimensional problem just means that there's things you need to worry about in both the x direction and the y direction. So kind of like in projectile motion, you need to start thinking of, you know, forces in terms of um, x forces and y forces. And I know we have Newton's second law, f net equals ma, but because of the way... Um, uh, vectors work and force is a vector, you can basically think of this as two separate equations. You can have an f net x equals m a x equation and an f net y equals m a y equation. And we've seen that before, um, but now we'll be seeing it more. Now more than ever, please make sure that you're sticking to the process that we've outlined before for doing new and second law problems. Okay, and always write down the sum of the forces before you plug in numbers. And that's really to help you, um, not only to make sure that you show enough work, but also to kind of lay out a map for you to see where to go next in the problem. Because it might not be so obvious when you're just reading a problem what you should do. Okay, but if you do these steps that I'm, I'm telling you to do, then you will at least be able to see where to go next, hopefully. Okay, so let's talk about friction. And we've already talked a little bit about friction before. Um, just a definition thing, a, a word you might see now and again. Um, this word translational equilibrium basically means when an object has a net force of zero. Um, that is, either it's moving at a constant velocity or staying at rest. The net force on the object is zero. And that state is called translational equilibrium. Um, but let's really focus in on this friction thing. Okay, so when you have two flat surfaces rubbing together, there's two types of friction that you might see. Okay, you have what's called static friction, and you have what's called kinetic friction. And so let's talk more about these things. Um, static friction, we've already kind of outlined how that works. Um, but basically the way static friction works is when you're pushing on an object um, and it's not moving, that type of friction that's preventing its motion is what's called static friction. So static means not changing. And then kinetic friction um, applies to an object that is moving, that is sliding across the surface. And there's equations for each of these, and so we're going to talk about each of them in turn. Um, but first, let's talk about the equation for um, kinetic friction, because it's a little bit easier to understand. And so the kinetic friction equation looks something like this. FFK that is the force of kinetic friction, is equal to mu k times fn. And this little thing here that looks like a u, that is a Greek letter. That is a mu. It's not an m and it's not a u. It is a mu, kind of like a cat's meow, like mu. Um, <laughs> and so what does mu represent here? Well, in this context, mu k represents what's called the coefficient of kinetic friction. And coefficient of kinetic friction, we'll, we'll come back to that in just a second, because um, I, I want to show you a chart. But basically, coefficient of kinetic friction is a, um, is a number that essentially represents how much friction there is between two surfaces. And so that coefficient of friction is a unitless number. It has no units. Um, it's typically less than one, it's usually a decimal between zero and one, and it's just a measure of how um, frictiony two surfaces are with each other. So for example, let's say you had like sandpaper and and copper, or, or I don't know, sandpaper and sandpaper. Imagine trying to rub two pieces of sandpaper together, it, it would be really difficult to do because it, they don't have a, an easy time sliding past each other because they're both kind of gritty. That you might expect to have a relatively high coefficient of kinetic friction, as opposed to, let's say, if you had like um, like a wax piece of wood sliding across uh, snow, like a sled, um, that you would expect to have a relatively low coefficient of kinetic friction because those two things, wax, wood, and, and, and snow, slide past each other very easily. That's why they make um, sleds out of them, out of wax wood. Okay, and so that's just a unitless number that kind of quantifies the stickiness between, or not stickiness, but how, how easily two um, surfaces slip past each other. So what this equation is saying is that the force of kinetic friction is equal to this coefficient of kinetic friction, this mu k value, 
um, times the normal force of that object times Fn. And we've seen the normal force before. We know that's the, the force that acts when you have a, um, a surface and it acts perpendicular to that surface. So just a couple things to point out about this force. Number one, um, this equation only lets you calculate the magnitude of the force of friction. Typically, the force of friction is going to, going to be acting in, in the negative direction because friction always opposes motion. And so normally, you have the object moving in the positive direction in your coordinate system. And so the force of friction would act in the negative direction. Now, this equation cannot give you a negative value because mu k is always positive and fn is usually p positive as well. And so this um, equation only lets you cal calculate the value of f of k. It doesn't take into account the direction. You have to take into account um, the sign on your own. Okay. Um, and before I show you um, this chart, actually, let me, let me go ahead and show it to you. So I'm going to erase this really quickly. So let's say, hypothetically speaking, if you were like an engineer or something and you were, were working with um, friction, then you would look up coefficients of friction in a table. Okay, so here is a table, um, and it basically just shows, you know, for this type of material rubbing against this type of material, what are what is the, the coefficient of kinetic friction or the co coefficient of static friction? And... Um, Depending on, on what values you need, you could find it in a table, or um, I guess you could you could measure them on your own, depending on how um, how accurate you need to be. But th these are things that are you know relatively constant for different types of surfaces. So for example, here we have like you know, silver rubbing against silver, or we have um, um, a tire rubbing against the road. So like you know, if you're driving your car, is made, your, your uh, rubber tires, or your tires on, on your car are made of rubber. So when you slam on the brakes and the tire skids, you're basically rubbing um, rubber versus the road. And so here you see the co coefficient of friction listed uh, for that situation. And so that's something if you were doing any type of engineering work where you actually needed those values, you would either look them up or I guess you could measure them on your own depending on what you need them for. Yeah, but they're, they're relatively constant and it's just based on the type of materials that are rubbing against each other. Um, but I want to talk about static friction before we move on. Um, so we've seen the equation for kinetic friction. The equation for static friction is a little bit different. Okay, so let me explain how this works. Let's say, hypothetically speaking, you have, um, you have a box. And let's say you want to move the box, and so you push the box. And just to save time on drawing this FBD, let's just for a second, forget about the normal force um, and the force of gravity, just so I don't take up too much room um, on this FBD. So let's say I push on a box with an applied force of, I don't know, 40 newtons, and the box doesn't move. Yeah, so that, that would mean that the force of static friction is opposing that motion, and if the box is at rest, that means the net force is zero, that means my, my push of 40 newtons is balanced out by the force of static friction, and that would also be 40 newtons. And again, if it, if, if it just bothers you to not have FG and FN on there, I can put them on there. Um, but really, I, I really only care about the, the applied force and the force of static friction for this example. Okay, so let's say I, want, I really want to move the box, so I push a little bit harder. And let's say I, um, I push now with an applied force of 45 newtons. Okay, so I push a little bit harder and the box still does not move. But if the box is still at rest, that means the net force in the box is still zero. That means the force of static friction has also increased to basically balance out my applied force. So now the force of static friction is 45 newtons. Okay, it has increased its value in proportion to my applied force. Okay, so this should give you an idea of how static friction works. The force of static friction basically matches your applied force. Now, you have to imagine there's a limit to this, right? If you push anything hard enough, it's going to move. Okay, so there's a threshold to the force of static friction. Okay, and so that's what we're going to see in just a second when I write the equation down. Okay, but I want, I want you to understand that concept so you understand why the equation looks the way it does for static friction. Okay, so here's what the equation looks like. I'm going to erase this picture. 
the force of static friction is less than or equal to mu s times fn, where here mu s represents the coefficient of static friction and fn represents the normal force uh, acting on the object. Okay, now, before anyone asks, why is there a less than sign in there? Why isn't that an equal sign? Well, because of what I just talked about with static friction. Remember, the, the force of static friction doesn't necessarily have a set value. It is whatever it has to be in order to keep the object at rest. But it can only go up to a certain point. In other words, the force of static friction for any given um, object and surface has a set value. It has a threshold value. And so that is what this is right here. Okay, so the force of static friction can be any value up to this threshold. And so to calculate the maximum value of the force of static friction, you, you would just multiply mu s times fn. Okay, so that's why it's less than or equal to, because it can have any value up to that maximum value. Okay, so unlike the force of kinetic friction, oops, unlike the force of kinetic friction equation where we have FFK equals um, mu K times FN, the force of uh, kinetic friction, that force is a fixed value, but the force of um, static friction can be a variable value. Again, it's whatever value it needs to be um, to stop the object from moving, it just can't go past that threshold. Okay, so pause there, make sure you add that to your notes. We have now seen all four equations that are in this unit. We have the all-powerful Newton second law, F net equals MA. We have our equation for the force of gravity. And then we have two equations for friction. And as far as equations go in this unit, that is it. Okay, so make sure you add those to your notes. All right, so I'm going to move on because I want to get to some examples. Okay, so go ahead and add this to your notes. Most of this we've already kind of talked about the difference between static friction and kinetic friction. Um, there is something I do want to point out, though. Generally speaking, as a general rule of thumb, it just happens to be factually true that the coefficient of static friction tends to be greater than the coefficient of kinetic friction for any two surfaces rubbing together. Um, there's not exactly a reason why that has to be the case. It's just experimentally speaking, that's how it turns out to be. And basically what that means is, in simple terms, it's harder to get something moving than it is to keep it moving. And so if you've ever tried to, to push anything really heavy, you might have experienced this. Once you actually get to move, it's easier to keep it moving. Okay, the hard part is getting it to move to begin with. And the reason is, typically speaking, the coefficient of static friction is greater than the coefficient of kinetic friction. So the split second it begins to move, it switches over from mu s to mu k, and that makes the force of friction jump down. And so that's why it's easier to keep something moving as soon as you actually get it to move. Okay, but most of the rest of this we've kind of already talked about. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do some examples so you can see how Newton's second law applies in these situations. Follow along carefully and make sure you're following the same process that I've outlined for you to approach Newton's second law problems. Okay, so let's start with example one. Example one says, a crate with a mass of 10 kilograms is pushed with a horizontal applied force of 100 newtons across a rough surface. Coefficient of kinetic friction is 0.45 between the crate and the surface. Notice, by the way, coefficient of friction has no units. Okay, that's how it's supposed to be. Determine the acceleration of the crate. So before I even look at the question too much, I'm going to draw a free body diagram because I know that should always be the first step in doing any second law problem. Okay, so let me draw an FBD. I have the force of gravity going down. Um, I know the crate is on a surface because it says so, which means there's a normal force perpendicular to the surface. So in this case, that would be up. And there is an applied force. And it doesn't say it's being pushed to the right, but I always like to, to put my applied force to the right for some reason. It just makes me happy. 
and I have kinetic friction, of course, opposing that motion. Okay, so the FBD should be drawn something like this. Now, the only thing you, you might could argue about is, why did I draw FA longer than FFK? Okay, do I know for a fact that this object is accelerating? And the answer is no. Um, I don't know that. There's nothing in the question that says that um, necessarily. Now, it does ask me to find the acceleration. I suppose it could be zero, um, but it's probably not likely. And so just in drawing the FBD, I can always go back and fix that if I need to. But in drawing the FBD, I'm going to assume at least for now that it is in fact accelerating in the same direction that the applied force is acting. And if that turns out to be wrong later on, I can go on and fix that. Um, step two. I'm going to write out my second law equations and determine the acceleration of the object. So here I have f net x equals max, and I have f net y equals ma y. Okay, here are my two second law equations, and I'm going to start with the x direction. Determine if the object is accelerating. Is it accelerating? My best guess is probably. Again, the question has asked me to find the acceleration, so most likely the answer is yes. I don't know the acceleration, but I can at least leave AX on the right side of the equation. Now, in the Y direction, the acceleration is zero. And the reason for that is this object is definitely not accelerating in the Y direction. Yeah, it's being pushed, but no matter how hard, hard it's pushed, it's not going to accelerate up or down. That doesn't make any sense. If it, if it accelerated up, that means it would like fly up into the air. Uh, and if it accelerated down, it would like go down in, into the ground through the surface, and neither of those make any sense. And so the object is at rest in the y direction, therefore the right side of this equation is going to be zero, because ay would be zero. And now I get to step three. I write down the sum of the forces before I plug in any numbers. So f net x, I have fa plus ffk. And F net Y, I have Fn plus Fg. And now my setup is done. And now I can actually look at the question. Okay. And so you can do most of these things without looking at the questions or the values too much. So the question is asking us to find the acceleration of the crate. Okay, so let's let's think about this logically. I want, want to find Ax. I don't care about Ay, it's zero. I want to find Ax. Think about what pieces of information you need to know to find AX. Okay, well, number one, you have to have the applied force. Luckily for us, we're actually given the applied force. Um, so I can plug that in. And we also need FFK. And if I had FFK, then I'd basically be done with the problem. Right, because FFK, because if I had this number, then I could add these things together and, um, and then just divide by 10 to get AX by itself. FFK is equal to mu K times FN. By the way, here's one of the, the big mistakes people make when they start off, is they see coefficient of kinetic friction, and they confuse this with force of kinetic friction. Don't confuse the kinetic friction coefficient with the actual force. Okay, two different things. You have to multiply the coefficient of kinetic friction by the normal force to give you the magnitude of of the actual uh, force of friction. So I don't know FFK, but I can find it. Okay, how do I find it? Well, I have mu K. Mu K is 0 0.45. And so now what I'm missing is I'm missing Fn. So I I'm trying to show you how these problem solving skills work so that you understand the approach of the question. Because once you get down to writing out the sum of the forces, that doesn't help you get the answer right away, but it, it at least gives you a map. Because then you can say, okay, I'm missing FA and FFK. Well, I'm actually given FA, so really I need FFK. How do I find FFK? I have an equation for that. Okay, What do I need for that equation? I have to have the normal force. How do you calculate the normal force in the crate? Luckily for us, we already did all this beautiful setup, and I can see Fn sitting right over here in this F net Y equation. Fn, I don't know what Fn is, but I can calculate Fg, because I have an equation for that. Fg equals Mg. And so that would be 10 times negative 10 
which is negative 100 newtons. And so Fn plus negative 100 equals zero. That means the normal force is 100 newtons. And now that I have Fn, I can multiply by mu k, which is my 0 0.45. And that gives me FFk is 45 newtons. Keeping in mind that this is only the magnitude of the force of friction, when I go to plug it in, I need to plug in negative 45 because the force of kinetic friction is acting in the negative direction. So now I can simplify and solve. 100 plus negative 45 is 55. And I can divide both sides by 10 to get AX. So the answer to the question, 55 divided by 10 is 5.5 .5 meters per second squared. Okay, and so you see now for the first time a two-dimensional second law problem involving friction. Okay, so pause it there and add that to your notes. Okay, so let's take a look at one or two more examples. Okay, so make sure you um, add this to your notes. I'm going to erase it in just a second. Okay, let's take a look at example two. So example two says a crate with a mass of 10 kilograms is pushed with a horizontal applied force of 50 newtons across a rough surface. The coefficient of static friction between the crate and the surface is 0 0.4. Determine whether or not the crate moves. Okay, so drawing an FBD here is going to be kind of hard because it doesn't actually tell me if the crate is moving or not. Basically, that's what I'm trying to find out. So for now, let's just say hypothetically speaking, just so I can draw my FBD. Let's say the crate doesn't move. Let's say I'm applying a force, let's say to the right, and let's say the, the crate stays at rest and the force of stack friction um, you know, balances out the applied force. Okay, I could be wrong about that, but let's just go with it for now and I can always go back and change that FBD if I need to. Okay, so step two, I'm going to write out my second law equations and determine the acceleration of the crate. Now in the y direction, because it is at rest in the y direction, I know for sure that this is going to be zero. In the x direction, if the crate does not move, then the right side of this equation should be zero because it's at rest in the x direction. So we're going with that assumption for now, and that might not be a good assumption, but we'll go with it for now. Okay, so let's see. So let's say this side is zero, which would be true if the object was at rest. On the right side, we write down the sum of the forces. And basically our objective is to see, is this equation true or not? Because we want to know, does the crate move or not. All right, so we know that the way static friction works is that it matches, um, it is less than or equal to mu s times fn, it matches the applied force up to a threshold. We know that the applied force is 50. And so let's see how 50 compares to the maximum value, that threshold value of static friction. Okay, so let's calculate that maximum value. FFS max, the maximum value of, of static friction force, would be equal to mu s times fn. At this point, you might say, um, you know, but we don't have fn. But because we did all that beautiful setup, we see fn right here is balancing out fg. We don't have an equation for fn, but we do have an equation for fg, and so we can calculate that. And so fg is going to be negative 100 newtons. And so fn is going to be 100 newtons. Now that I have fn, I can plug in to find the maximum value for static friction. That's 0.4 times 100, which is 40 newtons. So in other words, the maximum value for the force of static friction would be negative 40 newtons. Now, does that 
equal zero? No. Okay. So does the create move? Yes. The threshold for static friction was 40 newtons. If you apply force greater than that threshold, you're going to break past the force of static friction and the object is going to move. Okay, so this crate is in fact going to move. Okay, so pause there and add that to your notes. Okay, so I do have a third example, but I think I will do it in class. As always, please let me know if you have any questions, and I'll see you guys in the next video.